I'm Vance Bastian, here with my co-host, S.A. Bass Collins, for this week's Written on the Edge, Season 8, Episode 44, Friday Interview. We'll be talking with Kellyanne Parker and diving into her chapbook, Down the Foggy Streets of My Mind. get to know our guest. Kellyanne is a queer Latinx poet who uses poetry to reclaim the voices and the truth about surviving sexual trauma and violence on a mission to destigmatize and depathologize wow, pathologize disassociative disorders caused by trauma induced by others. Kellyanne's vision is a world free from victim blaming and shaming and I apologize for stumbling over the big words. No worries. No That's worries a first. That. It is a first. <laughs> I'll uh, take that as a badge of honor. It is a huge badge of honor, mostly because I wanted so hard to get it right, and I flubbed it anyway. So, Kellyanne, welcome to the show. Obviously, there was some stuff going on that made you feel you had to write it down. How much of that are you comfortable sharing? Oh, any of it. Yeah. So, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm really excited to be here. And though I talk about difficult topics, it's not always uh doom and gloom you know there are definitely uh benefits uh you know uh silver linings in uh in everything and so i i hope to bring that too perfect so let's talk about it the chat book down the foggy streets of my mind yeah great um i uh you know i'm a poet i've always written poetry, um, which is an interesting thing. I think for most poets and most writers, uh, we have this idea that that you need a certain amount of publishing in order to call yourself a writer or call yourself a poet. And I'd written poetry all, all my life. And um, it wasn't until I started getting published in anthologies that I felt comfortable enough saying, I am a poet, not just I write poetry. And um, and then, of course, what happened was uh, I uh, I had been speaking uh, or had been using um, doing poetry readings. I do a ton of poetry readings all over. Um, and actually, you know, just a little aside that one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that poetry readings became global. So nice. we would go, you know, to our regular poetry reading on Friday night and where it was locally just in Oakland or San Francisco. And we would have people from India and Australia and, you know, all literally all over the world. So many poetry readings are still on Zoom just because we don't want to lose that global audience. But, you know, I about 10 years ago, um, when I started uh, performing poetry, I would use that platform to usually start by saying, according to the World Health Organization, 25% of the global population lives with mental illness or addiction, and it's primarily caused by trauma and organic illness, but we don't talk about it, so I'm going to talk about it. And so that's how I would start a lot of my poetry readings. And um, I, you know, one thing about poetry is that it's very vulnerable. And usually the goal of the poet is to help uh, connect people either reading or listening to um, how the poet's feeling, right? So we try to write about um, how we feel and how, try to bring that to life. And so the more that I was doing that, the more I realized that it was going to be a book in itself, um, and there were certain pieces that just had to come out. And um, I uh, just the more I did it, the less fear fear I had about it. Uh, I remember uh, I had a couple of poems I was too afraid to do on stage in front of a bunch of white straight men. And courage. I wanted to spit it. And so um, I would read the audience and the more I felt like they needed to hear something, the more I would go all in and do it. 
Um, nice. And that's really sort of how it came about. Yeah. Nice. So can I ask what the, like, for, for instance, just to get people into your work, what would be one of the topics that you would not at first have shared with a straight white male audience that in fact you felt they had to hear? Um, so I have a poem called The Day I Stop Feeling, and it's a poem about sexual assault. And um, there uh, are parts about uh, that talk about being abducted and taken to a remote area. And uh, there's a few F-bombs in it. And, um, and when I say it, I don't read it very nicely. And so I think a lot of it was... Um, trying to hold it back not necessarily feeling safe and then getting to a place where oh no the this is the people who need to hear this the impact you know mm -hmm. do you mind if i ask how audiences have received it actually um i'm glad you asked that question because that's kind of what fueled me to keep going and um what ended up has what has ended up happening is that at every performance, even on Zoom, people will private message me. They'll wait for me to get off the stage. And often they tell me their own personal story that they've never told anyone. And wow. that's been true for men um, and women. I've had people uh, in their late 70s tell me a story that they've never told anyone. Um, and to be able to just be present and hold a safe space for somebody to to finally get it out um, has been an honor. Wow. So basically, you just help people connect with emotions. Yes, I, I love that. That is the best work in the world. Thank you. It feels that way. So has it been healing for you? Yes. Um, so as I was putting the book together, and just for people who don't know, I have a DID, it's dissociative identity disorder. And when I was diagnosed in 1991, it was still called multiple personality disorder. So you can imagine the kind of stigma. Um, I had over 20 years, I didn't tell anyone mm. about my diagnosis, because I knew like, Sybil and Jekyll and Hyde and, you know, all these tropes about uh, how people thought people like me moved in the world, which weren't true, although we have our crises at, you know, certain places of our life, but oh, sure. that there's a healing that can come from that and that the biggest misconception about mental illness is that we're um, unsafe um, I think that's the biggest misconception. And usually if we're not safe, it's we're not safe to ourselves. Um, and I really want to help to dispel that. So um, writing um, about uh, DID, I would just start to talk, uh, talk about it, read about it. And I realized that I, I had a chapbook's worth of material. And although this mine is a chapbook, I have... 89 pages of poetry, which is like a page shy of really being a full collection, but I was submitting it to uh, a chapbook com competition. And uh, thankfully, um, J.K. Fowler, who is the founder of Nomadic Press, uh, believed in what I was doing and uh, ended up publishing it. And now, um, uh, Nomadic has since closed, and uh, thankfully, I was one of the authors that was picked up by Black Lawrence Press, so my book lives there now. Um, but as it got down time to it, I I kind of toggled between alluding to having, you know, I was saying PTSD or DID or dissociative disorders, and then just naming it and just saying this, you know, this is what I have. And uh, I was down to the last week of uh, submitting my final manuscript and working with my editor. And I was like texting him every day, like, I'm going to go through with it. I know I'm going to go through with it, but I'm terrified. And I would like take it out and put it back in and take it out and put it back in. And then finally, um, I knew I needed to do it. And so I did, and I'm glad I did, but it was 
it was pretty terrifying. I will tell you that. So you kind of live in a constant state of coming out, both queer as well as the disorder. I mean, has this helped solidify for you how you approach others with it? Um, you know, I have shared this information and it's gone great. And just like coming out as queer, it hasn't always gone well. Interesting. Um, and that's okay because I, the pain of hiding it is far worse than the pain of rejection. Mm -hmm. That's fair. I have a question. I have a question for you. And this is, I'm going to preface this with an experience I had with it before I get to my question for you. So just bear with me. Um, one of the things I love about the arts, no matter where, what spectrum or what portion of or genre you're doing of the arts um, is that it's always an amazing feeling when you connect with someone who probably would never have connected with the work and, um, you know, I come from the world of opera and I remember we did an outreach program in um, the Vadio down here in San Diego and we did the Mikado for that community. And we had a bunch of Latinos come in and, you know, people who have probably never seen an opera before. Of course, Mikado is a comic opera. It's an operetta. Um, and I remember after the show was done, I had several Latinos families come up to me and have the conversation of, oh, we never knew it could be like this. So I'm wondering as a poet, because I remember being creative writing classes and anytime we approach poetry, everybody was kind of blanched and went, oh no, oh God, here we go, you know? And so I'm wondering because poetry is often seen as an elevated thing. I mean, even Mrs. Basil made, poked fun at its elevatedness by having a black beatnik woman poet doing a, a poetry about Wichita and all she does is kept repeating the word, you know? So there's this perception that poetry is elevated and it's hard to grasp or understand. Have you ever had a moment where somebody came up to you and said, you know, I never knew it could be like this. I, I, I never knew I could connect with poetry like this. And what did it, how did it make you feel if that did happen? Thank you for the question. I, I, um, I've had similar types of circumstances, and mainly, um, I consider myself a, a, a myself, which is true, uh, a street poet, and um, I often move between the world of street poetry and academic poetry, and I think that's a lot of what people are referring to, and it, you know, it's really interesting because. <clears throat> With academic poetry, um, some of it is what I call pretty word poetry, where it's like skipping through the daisies. And <laughs> and all I can say is whatever, you know, like, what are you trying to say? And is this about you? Is like where that is esoteric the, feeling to it? Yeah. Where's the person in there, you know, and um, and so I often don't connect with that type of poetry. So what I have heard is younger people approach myself or other uh, street poets and just were like, yeah, you know, you told, you know, either you told my story or they connected with something that you had to say or, um, you know, an angry poem where it's, you know, what we call, a, a, I hope I can use F-bombs, but, you Make know, sure. fuck you poems. Mm -hmm. And people connect with, the feeling that's just they want to feel something so they want the visceralness you know, I, of it yeah exactly and so um often you know sort of the buttoned up stuffy types of you know academic poetry where the form is perfect and oh you know that's a perfect sestina which is amazing it's like uh you know, doing a still life that, you know, painting that looks like a photograph. Um, and it's pretty incredible that people can do that. But at the same time, you know, so what, you know, um, is kind of how, you know, I feel and how I uh, approach that. On the flip side, uh, there are a lot of people in the very uh, stodgy 
of old school type of poetry that uh, call, you know, the type of work that uh, that I do either Vic Lit or trauma porn. And uh, interestingly enough, the most popular poet out there, Ruby Core, who self-published herself and has done a worldwide tour with sold out audiences, talks about her depression and talks about her own painful experiences in a way that connects with people that is relatable. And, and yeah. do, when you had those moments, how did you feel like, because I think as artists, no matter what part of the art spectrum you're in, your whole drive is to make that human connection. And so when you have street poetry, which is much more visceral, much more in the moment, much more heartfelt, it's not so flowery and esoteric. When people said those things to you, how, what, what did, did you feel like, oh, yes, this is why I'm doing this? Or, you know, what, what, did, what did it evoke in you? Absolutely. I mean, having the connection to the audience is like, that's the high, that's the drug mm -hmm. of like, mm -hmm getting up there and connecting there's a magic there's an alchemy when you are you know you pull people in and you're connected to them and they're connected to you it's just something really beautiful it there's not there's nothing to describe it really yeah and I think when people do experience it's like a, there's an electricity in the air you know what I mean you can you can just feel that something is very different you know so i just wanted to ask you because i i always like when i hear people talk about working in a genre that's often perceived as being elevated and mm -hmm. yet there is a path for people to access it um so i just kind of like to have that conversation whenever i get a chance so thanks for entertaining my questions there it's a great question is there anything about your work that you want people to know that we didn't think to ask um, you know, in, you know, the only way to get through like grief or trauma is to get through it. And so the hard things that might be there in my work are the path to healing. And if you read it, uh, there is an arc, uh, in the book of moving through and beyond, um, what has happened. So I think a lot of times people might be afraid that it's just all bam, 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 bad things, bad things, bad things. But it really, it's a book about uh, healing and the human spirit and how we overcome difficulty. Wow. So I'm going to correct one word you said in there. You said, if people read it, I want you to say when people uh, read it. When people read it. There you go. Thank you. thank you. That part, that part right there. <laughs> That far. I love that. All right. Are you ready for our get to know you questions? Absolutely. Take it away, Baz. All right. So in this year of wow, what one word describes your favorite food? Guacamole. No Ooh. question. Oh, there you Yum. go. There you go. Yes. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> okay. Your favorite entertainment genre? Uh, poetry readings. Okay you're right in the vein then you know <laughs> i go to a lot of them a lot All right, there you go okay where are you in the spectrum of mundane versus magical 100 percent magical i'm a witch yes yes, yes. <laughs> i'm down with that okay your preferred level of pda uh cringeworthy really <laughs> okay i love it I, f I feel you. Okay. Uh, the environment where you relax the most. I, I love anything with water. So the word would be ocean, I guess. Okay. All right. Um, the uh, see your preferred beverage. Coffee. <laughs> massive mug of coffee. <laughs> massive, mu massive mugs. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. If you could, you'd pop an IV and walk around. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where do you fall on the scale of youthful naivete versus the wisdom of experience? I'm a crone. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Embrace it. Thank My you. mom often says that because she has super white hair and 
people say, you know, well, how come you don't like color it? And she says, no, 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 no. Those are my trophies. That shows I survived. <laughs> I love that. My trophies are blue now, like kind of a oh, blue. Oh, that's color. okay. That's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just the shade of your trophies. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. Well, what's your favorite fictional character? Um. So I, I know you've had her on the show, but uh, Liz Frame has... Uh, Vivian Chastain, the uh-huh. series. Uh, I love those books. We'll definitely let her know that you gave a shout out to her. Mm-hmm. All right. And finally, your favorite mode of travel. Uh, road trip all the way. So I'm going to say car. Music Excellent. on, singing. As badly. driver or as passenger? Driver. Always driver. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, you made it through this. Bravo. <laughs> Woo! Well, what have you got coming up? Um, more poetry readings, something people should know about, dates, times, share. Uh, so I have a couple things, and um, I know you, you're going to share my website or mm-hmm. link tree. So I post uh, event links and dates and stuff on there, and I can give you some as well. Um, I... Uh, I'm going to be uh, doing a couple of readings coming up. Uh, m- most recently, I was in Colossus Body. Ooh. And Colossus, uh, it is an anthology to the sovereignty of self. And the money is going to go to um, save our clinics. Um, and I was really excited to be part of this project. I've been in, this is the third of their anthologies I've been in. They do we've raised money for moms for housing and all kinds of really cool stuff. And they're just really, really cool people. So if you want to read the best Bay area poetry, uh, there you go. Boom. And uh, I'm trying to uh, think of, uh, I have two things in November and one of them is with Colossus. And um, I'm also going to be reading with the Bay area Queer Writers Association or BAKWA. Yeah. Um, there's a new <laughs> anthology. Yay! I don't have my copy in front of me because I haven't picked it up yet, but it was recently released earlier this month and it's called Queer Cheer. And I have three poems in there and, nice. um, or two poems in there, and they're both holiday related and a little fun and kitschy. So uh, I went you know, glitter, sparkle, holiday all the way. I love it. All right. Any final words of wisdom? Um, you know, as I said, 25% of the world population has mental health or addiction. So if it's not you, it's somebody very close to you. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, labels, whatever they are, if they're queer, if they're whatever, it, it doesn't, it, it tells us, it gives us information about people, but it doesn't tell you exactly who they are. So if we can learn to get beyond the labels and just to get to know people on a human level, um, I think uh, you'll be rewarded, richly rewarded. Bravo. Excellent. All right, folks, we'd like to extend a huge thank you to Kellyanne Parker for joining us. Kellyanne, thank you so very much. Thank you. And don't pick forget up, pick up the book pick right. up the book we at written on the edge are proud to introduce a new media by queer content creators if you enjoy learning about new artists or hearing our thoughts on entertainment media like and subscribe so you get the alerts for new episodes the show was produced by rogue ravens media for our disclaimers links to social media our listen stations or to sign up as a guest visit www.roadpodcast.com tune in next week for your queer media fix Closing time. The bums rush in melody, dear.